morning, ladies and gentlemen. First, uh, let me uh, thank you for dropping up so early uh, to participate this preliminary uh, session. Uh, uh, you know, uh, from the uh, yesterday opening uh, plenary session, the topic is climate change, um, uh, which shows the importance of climate issue in the field of energy economics. So today, we are going to focus on the pathway full of carbon development. Yeah, we are going to talk about the today and the interest choice, and talk about the cost, benefit, and the policy options, technological options, and all these uh, policy implications. Uh, for this uh, important issue, we have invited three uh, distinguished uh, speakers. So uh, let me uh, take a few minutes to introduce our uh, speakers. Uh, Professor uh, Andrew, Andreas Ruscio um, is a professor uh, and director of the Center of Applied Economic Research uh, in the University of Worcester. Uh, he was the lead author of the fifth assessment report of Working Group 3 uh, of IPCC. Uh, he was in charge of uh, Chapter 6, uh, Accessing Transformation uh, Pathways. Uh, he is the uh, chairman of the German uh, government, uh, governmental expert uh, commission to monitor uh, the energy transformation. Today, he is going to uh, talk about the trade-off between climate actions today and the future options uh, with focus on uh, Europe's uh, 2050 uh, framework. And our uh, second speaker is uh, Professor Chen Wenyi uh, Chen. Uh, she's uh, the deputy, uh, deputy director of the Institute of Energy, Environment, and Economy at Tsinghua University of China. Um, she uh, was the coordinating uh, leader also for the second national assessment on climate change. Uh, she serves as the review editor of the IPCC fifth assessment report, uh, World Group 3, Climate Change Mitigation, and the IPCC fifth assessment uh, and successors report. Uh, today, she's going to present the long-term low-carbon development pathway in China. Uh, finally, our uh, third speaker is uh, Mr. Oleg Peter Heifer. Uh, uh, he uh, has been involved in the development of renewable energy for many years. Uh, he's the uh, country manager of uh, Turkey of the state crop. Uh, today, he's going to talk about the sustainable development of uh, hydropower and other renewables. So now, uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Professor Alusha to give uh, his presentation. Scenarios and 
900 uh, mitigation scenarios. There was uh, actually an open call to monthly groups to submit scenarios uh, for these assessments, or uh, groups could submit uh, their mitigation pathways uh, for uh, to be considered in the IPCC um, report. Uh, as I said, about 20 uh, research groups actually have taken advantage of this opportunity and submitted a total of around 1,200 scenarios. And then these scenarios were grouped, as I will show you, uh, into uh, different categories, into different bins, uh, and uh, a lot of the discussion that you can see is focusing uh, on the uh, on the two degrees target, uh, which is uh, the target that is uh, now mentioned in the international documents, now as a target uh, for the global community, and uh, therefore you will see a lot of uh, results uh, related to the two degrees target, but they have put as well uh, on on other. Um, temperature pathways, and it's clear if you uh, look at the numbers that uh, reaching this 2 degree target will involve substantial technological, economic, and institutional challenges, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to highlight a bit that these challenges are really huge, you know, they are very high. Um, and, uh, uh, and you can as well see that even less ambitious uh, mitigation scenarios uh, are not so different, uh, but they as well um, um, require fundamental deviation from the baseline, uh, which is a decrease of temperature of around 4 to 5 degrees compared to pre-industrial levels. Um, and here you see uh, in this first um, graph uh, uh, all the different scenarios and what they actually imply. The red ones are the, um, the baseline scenarios, the reference scenarios. Okay, so the red ones are the, the, um, the reference scenarios that are leading uh, to uh, 4 to 5 degrees uh, uh, pre-industrial uh, temperature increase. Uh, then you see the, the blue scenarios that is uh, in line with 2 degree target, so 66% change of global temperature increase less than 2 degrees above pre-industrial. Uh, and then you see these, these other pathways um, that are then uh, three or four degree pathways, and you can see these 1,200 scenarios uh, grouped in the uh, database of chapter six. Um, it's very important, uh, and I'm going to talk about this now. Thanks a lot. Professional. Um, I guess it's a shame if you're a university professor and you don't have that. Uh, but nevertheless, okay. Um, so, so I'm going to talk a bit about this uh, uh, here, which is uh, net negative global emissions, because you will see that this plays in effect a big role. So, if you look at uh, these different pathways, you see here the reference, and then you see the decarbonization. Uh, and you see that many of these uh, scenarios are actually uh, touching this area here, which is net negative global emissions. And so these are the emissions now only from fossil fuels and from cement uh, in gigatons. And this is the PAU. Now oh, you can see that the PAC uh, will have to see a drastic uh, change if we want to be somewhere in this range of the two degrees target. Well, the, um, the first thing that is then done uh, in these assessments is um, the different, um, the different scenarios uh, are grouped in their economic costs. Um, so here you can see that, well, the economic costs increase if you're moving towards more stringent scenarios. So here is a concentration uh, in PPME uh, CO2 equivalent. So the 450, this is the two degrees, you now uh, sees a uh, higher cost, obviously, than uh, these lower ambition uh, targets. And uh, you can see here this cost in reduction in consumption uh, relative to baseline percent. And uh, this is the number uh, reaching more than 11% uh, in 2100 then uh, for the two degrees, uh, 450 ppm scenario. And then in the IPC report, uh, that is transformed into an annualized uh, consumption loss, which is uh, for this scenario 
0.06% compared to uh, 1.5 to 3% of consumption growth over the next uh, 90 years. Uh, so therefore, uh, um, you can actually infer that well, reaching the target doesn't cost a lot. No, it's almost costless. No, it's 0.06% compared to a consumption increase of 1.5 to 3 percent is almost nothing, no? Uh, but of course, I mean, the assumptions that are behind uh, these numbers are that you know, all countries of the world begin mitigation immediately, and there is a single carbon price, and all key technologies are available. And if you think about these four assumptions, it's clear that none of these assumptions will hold in the future, and that will of course impact on the one in the feasibility of these scenarios, but as for the cost implication of reaching the different scenarios. So in the IPC report, there are actually uh, there's some, some work then done on looking if some of these assumptions are not going to hold, and I'm going to show you two example, uh, examples. The one is the assumption we begin mitigation immediately, because that's the trade-off we want to talk about, short-term action versus long-term goals. So what happens if we begin later? That will, of course, make it much more difficult to reach the target and will, as well, make it more costly. And I'm as well talking about uh, the last assumption. All key technologies are available. So what happens if we don't have the full technology set, especially if we don't have CCS and bioenergy? And then, then uh, I said I want to have a short uh, look at um, the other two things, because that is very country specific, so it's difficult to talk about on a global scale. So I'm going to say something about what happens if not all countries of the world are doing mitigation, because that will have direct consequences on efficiency and on effectiveness of the policy. We'll see leakage, we'll see competitive concerns, we'll see increasing costs because of inefficient implementation of this global mitigation target. And then I'm going to as well show you uh, briefly what happens if we don't have a single global carbon price. Which of course that's not the case. So if you look at uh, Europe for example, we have uh, many policies you know, that are directing uh, CO2 emission reduction, energy efficiency improvement, uh, subsidies for or support for renewables. And if you count the number, you know, there should be around 1,000 of these different policies in Europe overlapping be complementary or supplementary uh, in uh, one way or the other, and thereby as well changing feasibility and cost of these policy So let me uh, start um, uh, briefly with this uh, immediate action. So what happens uh, if we have immediate action or if we don't have immediate action? So here you see this is immediate action, which means that, well, we are more or less speaking today, and then, then we reduce uh, global uh, CO2 uh, emissions, so the emissions are basically not uh, growing beyond uh, today's uh, emission levels. Um, if this is the case, then even there uh, we see um, a an, an, uh, reduction requirement that is unprecedented. So here we see the reduction of the emission uh, changes uh, between 2000-2010, which increased. Um, we, we would have uh, in the future, if we if we follow this path here, we would have to have uh, something like a three percent per year uh, rate of uh, decarbonization, which is, as I said, uh, high. Um, we will as well have to see a scale up of low carbon um, energy, a substantial scale up, uh, almost a doubling in the period uh, after 2030. Uh, in order to be on these uh, mitigation tracks. Well, what happens if we, we, if we don't follow this route, if we, if we delay action? Uh, this is now, uh, everybody starts in 2010 to decarbonize. Okay? But here uh, we already know that you know, these are the Cancun pledges, so whatever comes out of Paris might be likely into this light green area, which is labeled delayed action in the uh, IPC report, which means that uh, emissions are still increasing and the turning point is later than today. Uh, what that, does that imply? Well, if you again look at uh, the uh, related 
emission reductions, you can see, well, now it's not only 3%, but it's 6% per year uh, CO2 reduction that you have to achieve in order to still be on the 450 ppm track, in order to be on the 2 degrees track. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, what, the, what are the consequences for, um, for the renewables, then uh, renewables have to be uh, uh, almost tripled instead of doubled uh, if we delay action. And of course, as for the cost associated with these scenarios uh, are much higher uh, than, uh, than in the previous ones, uh, so we have to do much more. And uh, if we follow these pledges, then the uh, mitigation challenge for, for being on this 2 degree track will be much more substantial. And then still assuming you know, we have all the technologies, you know, uh, everything in place, uh, I'm coming to that later. So this is um, so this is peak emission in 2030, and these are then the scenarios. And then you can see that well, in these scenarios, uh, you have to decarbonize really rapidly. So within 30, I mean, you know, we don't do a lot until 2030, but then in 30 years we are fully decarbonizing the economy, and then we are running on a negative emission technologies afterwards. Uh, so you can already see from this. Kind of, uh, Slide, then this will be really important. Uh, we need very fast decarbonization. We need a lot of negative emissions. Now let's relax the other assumption uh, that is uh, technologies. So let's ask for the from the IPC report. And now different technologies are actually taken out of the technology portfolio of these integrated system models. So um, and you can see what are the impact in terms of increase in mitigation costs relative to this default technology assumption. And there you see, well, there are two technologies that seem not to play such an important role. The first one is uh, nuclear. So if we, if we forbid nuclear as a low carbon uh, technology, costs are increasing, but probably at a relatively moderate rate. Um, if we limit the solar or winds or renewables, then as well costs are increasing, but in a relatively moderate way. Um, so the really two big things are if we limit uh, bioenergy use, and you see especially uh, if we are running on these two uh, two degree target scenarios. But even have more heavily, if we if we don't consider carbon capture and sequestration. So without carbon dioxide capture and sequestration, these costs are much higher, especially in the um, more ambitious scenario, which just reflects you know, the fact that this scenario built heavily on these technologies. And uh, you can see that, well, even with these uh, two changes, costs are pretty different. So 50% to 100% cost increase was limited by our energy. Um, and here it's uh, 50% to 250% uh, cost increase with, with uh, no carbon dioxide. Capture storage, so the costs might be you know, four times the cost that we already heard about, um, just if we relax the technology fixes. Okay, and you can see here the same uh, graph. Actually, the interesting thing is if we if we forget about negative emissions, out of these 12 scenarios, only six are left. Okay, there are only six scenarios in the database that are left uh, without negative emissions. And, and how do they uh, shape? Well, you see, but they have to decarbonize later in 2050. And that means, since this is without CCS, that means no negative emissions, no fossil fuels. Okay? So if you don't believe in large scale deployment of CCS, then uh, the consequence is no fossil fuels by 2050. Otherwise, you won't. And the energy mix then is uh, carbon neutral, carbon neutral bioenergy, nuclear, uh, solar, wind, and it has to come uh, really, really quick. Okay, so um, to wrap that up, if all countries of the world begin mitigation immediately with a single global carbon price and technologies all available, then the two degrees target has very low economic costs. Um, we've seen that well, feasibility is unclear. No, even in this case, because it requires fast decarbonization, 3%, okay, and it requires a large-scale application of bioenergy and CCS available 
the technology has to be available, it has to be scaled up uh, from uh, current uh, situation. And then if technologies are not available, uh, due to technology constraint or due to political constraint, especially with CCS and the bioenergy option, then the cost might be much higher and the feasibility of the scenarios is really reduced. You know? So a lot of the models cannot run uh, this type of assessment because then they, they won't uh, uh, find solutions in these cases. Um, delay action, as for example in the, with the current lectures uh, in the uh, IPC, in the UNFC process, will of course reduce uh, feasibility and increase cost further, uh, which is not taken into account, into account uh, really. And then there are two other issues I have not touched, which is unilateral policies and inefficient implementation. And uh, there I just want to uh, give you a small flavor of this uh, problem um, uh, in, the, in the European setting, uh, because Europe has, of course, as well as transformation pathway uh, to 2050, uh, the road, new roadmap for low carbon economy 2050 foresees a reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 80% versus 1990, and then the share of renewables of more than 50% in electricity uh, in 2050. Um, um, I've been involved in the, in the assessment of the, in the impact assessment uh, for this 2050 roadmap. And what we looked at, beyond other things, was exactly the impact of fragmented action. So the EU is doing something and the rest is doing less. Um, and as well in the, uh, in the impact of inefficient policy implementation. So we don't have a single carbon price in Europe, no? but we have fragmented situation. We have impl imperfect, inefficient implementation uh, with uh, a carbon price in the ETS that is very different from the carbon price in all the other sectors with many other instruments uh, on top of that. Uh, so we have both inefficiencies. And we can see that, well, this is actually a huge impact on costs uh, if we do this fragmented, uh, because then we have if in efficiency we are not using low cost mitigation options, uh, but we do a lot at home, um, and as well we see uh, competitive effects in, um, uh, in energy intensive sectors that are uh, uh, under international competition, which is uh, as well an efficiency, uh, an effectiveness problem because uh, we have something like 20 percent mitigation and uh, reduced activity in the energy um, intensive industries. And as well as I said, the fragmented action uh, can lower the cost substantially. So if we implement these policies efficiently, and uh, just um, um, as the final slide, uh, I want to show you this. Uh, well, the first, first thing, well, this is the reference. Uh, here we've actually as well looked at what does it cost to implement the reference. I mean, that is something that is usually not taken into account, but of course, as well, in the reference case, I mean, there are some carbon price implemented. In our case, you need, or, already for the reference of the EU, uh, this carbon price of six zero. Uh, so reference was something, and then we measure against this reference. So you can see that fragmented action is actually much uh, more expensive than, for example, here this global action, um, where the costs are indeed relatively low, uh, but we think that this is probably an unrealistic assumption. And you can as well see here, this is uh, a national EU wide uh, efficient implementation. Uh, you can as well see that already with an EU wide efficient implementation in this uh, scenario six, costs are reduced a lot, or turn it other way around if we move away from the ideal assumption of uh, CO2, um, uh, of CO2 uh, carbon prices that are equalized among all the sources, it can become much more costly. And as uh, Richard Polly has said, say, uh, there are uh, indefinite, indefinite uh, possibilities to increase cost of carbon policies. Uh, so this is probably as well only the bottom line. Okay, thanks a lot.
regions had a long term, no carbon development pathways in China. And firstly, I would like to introduce the modeling framework for this research, and then I will introduce the historical trends of China's carbon emission and its key drivers, and also the approach for future energy service demand projection. Finally, the low carbon development pathway, uh, pathways will be presented on the basis of the analysis of the reference scenarios and zero mitigation scenarios. And we use the model and uh, name is the China Mata and Times model, and this model is a dynamic energy system organization model. And the model was developed for five year intervals extending from 2010 through 2050 based on a reference energy system. And the model can incorporate a full range of energy processes, including exploration, convention, transmission, distribution, and also energy use. And this model is also linked with uh, energy service demand projection model. And the model projects the, the uh, over 40 end use uh, energy service demand uh, service uh, for the uh, more than 40 end use demand sectors in the model. And also the China Macau and Times model consists of more than 40, uh, 400 technologies both in the surprise and demand size. And the first model was developed in the beginning of 2000, and the model was upgraded continually and successfully applied in around 20 projects, including national projects, for example, funded by NDRC, uh, MOST, and NFSC, and also applied in several uh, international cooperation projects, for example, CETP, Home Projects, SPF, NGS, and MOST, etc. And the model, we have the zero model, and we have the standard markup times model, and also we have a markup times uh, ED model that can incorporate uh, energy demand into the model. So the carbon mitigation in the model can not only solve by the technology option and also by the reduction of energy service demand. And also we have the uh, markup macro model, this markup language uh, macro model. And also we have regional model, for example, Western China Macau model. In the model, we consider water resource constraint, and also the model is something which a uh, state city model. Now we are building a five region China Macau water model, and also two region global type model. Now uh, look at the historical trends. From the uh, left graph, you can see the population in China grows uh, around about uh, one in uh, 1 billion to about 1.3 billion in, uh, by 2050, uh, by 2010, sorry. And the organization rate grew very fastly from about 20% 10, uh, 20 in 1980 to about 50% by the end of 2010, so about 1% annually increase of organization rate. And the GDP growth you can see from the uh, right, right, Uh, the right figure you can see uh, the CDP uh, by the end of 2010 is about uh, 17 times of the of that of uh, 1980. That means annual GDP growth rate during the past three decades is about nine percent. And you can also see that uh, the value editor, the share of value editor of the primary uh, industries decreased from 30 percent in 1980 to about 10 percent by the end of 2010. While the share, uh, share of value editor from the territory uh, industries increased from about 20% to about 45% by the end of 2010. So, with the uh, fast growth of the economic and also organization rate, you can see the, uh, the, the fast growing of the energy service demand in the three end use sectors industry sector to the patient sector and building sector for example you can look at you can look at the first graph see that the steel production increase actually about uh, 17 times 17 times of the steel production by the end of 2010 compared of level in 1980 and cement is about 25 times of the uh, uh, by the end of 2010 compared with 1980 and for the uh, car industry, uh, actually grow very fast to about uh, 40 vehicle, uh, 40 vehicle per thousand uh, people by the end of 2010. And the total turnover of freight and passenger transport increased about 11 times in the last three decades. 
And also of course, uh, growth base, you can see also faster growth. So about uh, five times of the uh, incre increment of the growth base. So by the end of 2010, it's about totally uh, 50 billion of square meters of growth base in China, including in the urban rural and also commercial uh, building. So consequently, you can see in the final energy uh, consumption increase running faster about uh, 4.5 times of 2010 compared with the uh, 20, uh, 1980 level. And primary energy consumption actually uh, increased about 4.5. So uh, the, uh, the level in 2010 is about 5.5 uh, times of the uh, 1980 and also co-dominated in the energy supply during about uh, uh, 65 cents in the total energy consumption. And carbon emission, you can see, actually also grow very fast. So by the end of 2010, the carbon emission from the fossil fuel combustion is about 3.2 billion in China. So how uh, how to develop uh, the future scenarios? The, the best we have to define the key drivers for future carbon growth. Firstly, is the, uh, the GDP growth. We assume that the, the GDP, annual GDP growth rate uh, between 2010 to 2020 will decrease to around 7.4% annually, and then will decrease to 6%, 4.5%, and 3% in the next uh, three, 10 years period. So by the end of 2050, the China's GDP will about eight times of less in 2010. And also for the industry structure, uh, uh, we assume that the, uh, the share of value added from Tesla industries will increase to about uh, 65 cents by the end of 2050, so close to the current OECD countries level. And the population will pick around 2035, around 1.47 billion people, and urbanization rate is best to increase to about 75 cents by the end of 2050. And this is so the annual sector we consist in the model and for example industry sector we consist more than 10 energy intensive sector covering steel, cement, ammonia, paper, aluminum, etc. And transportation sector we divide into freight transport and passenger transport and then further divide into for example highway transport, uh, waterway transport, uh, airway and uh, highway etc. And for building, we divide into uh, residential sector and commercial sector, and residential sector is very divided into urban area and rural area. And the space heating and cooling, and also uh, water heating and cooking, and also electric appliance and lighting, etc., are consistent for all these building types. And there are different approaches for, to develop, uh, to project the future energy service demand for this sector. Take example of steel. So for the steel projection, we apply a stock-based material growth approach. We consist of nine main steel consumers, including, for example, building construction, automobile, or automobile and also household uh, electric appliance sector. For example, for the building sector, we, we, we have to, uh, on the base of the current building stock and the vintage of the building stock, and also lifetime, lifetime of the building and steel intensity of building for future, and also the, future, the, the projection of future stock uh, uh, growth based uh, projection, then we can estimate each year the newly need demand uh, for steel and also uh, the uh, steel, uh, scrap steel from the base up of the old building buildings. And the results of the steel demand in China will pick around uh, 20, 15 years at around eight, uh, uh, 800 million tons, and then will decrease uh, culturally to about 400 million tons by the end of 2050. But uh, the sensitivity analysis shows that the steel demand in the future is uh, you know, highly uh, uh, influenced by the future GDP growth rate, urbanization rates. And also we are influenced by, for example, the lifetime of the building in China, and also the celebration raised for building, for automobile, for also electric appliance, etc. And this uh, uh, comes to the building sector. Uh, for the building, we project uh, by the end of 2050 uh, about uh, uh, the, the total growth rate will uh, it grows to about uh, from currently uh, uh, 50 billion uh, square meter to 800, uh, uh, 85, uh, 85 billion, uh, billion square meter by the end of 2050. <coughs> and uh, from the capital level, you can see 
in the Peking Tunnel by 2050 is very close to the Japan's current level, both for regional sector and commercial sector. And also, we, uh, in order to uh, project the, the cooling demand and uh, space heating demand, we divide into the uh, whole China into four prime regions. They super cold regions, cold region, and hot summer, uh, cold winter, hot summer, warm winter, the four regions. And for these four region, uh, regions, they share about 10 percent, and 30 percent, 40 percent, and 20 percent of the total floor space. And also, we based on the uh, different regions, uh, heating degree uh, days and cooling degree days, etc. We project future uh, space heating demands and cooling demand and, 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 and our end service demands uh, for the building sector. For the transportation sector, uh, we project the, the, the private car ownership will uh, increase to about four, 400 per, uh, vehicle per thousand uh, people by the end of 2050. But the travel intensity will decrease from the currently 20,000 kilometer per year to about 8,000 uh, kilometer per year by the end of 2050. You can so, uh, see that uh, all of the, the, the uh, transport, pa uh, uh, transport uh, uh, passenger turnover will increase to about uh, uh, by the end of 20, uh, 2050, so about uh, four times, uh, five times actually as the, uh, the, the, the level in 2010. Now, right transport, uh, uh, compared to the passenger growth, it will grow the most slowly because of the example, picking of coal in, in China uh, around 2025. So the total uh, right transport is about uh, three times of that uh, uh, level in 2010 uh, by the end of 2050. So now come to the reference scenarios, you can see the finally energy consumption will keep growing from the two billion Co-equivalent at 2010 to about uh, 5 million pounds co-equivalent by the end of 2050. But you can see the co-share in the final energy consumption will decrease from about 40% uh, to about 20% by the end of 2050. And electricity output is back to increase to about uh, uh, 40,000 terawatt hours. That means uh, the per capita electricity consumption will increase to 8,000 kilowatt per year per capital by the end of 2050. And for the primary end consumption, uh, it will still keep growing and it will uh, uh, grow to about uh, 7 billion pounds per year by the end of 2050. But cost share will decrease to about 50% uh, of the total. And carbon emission will pick around uh, 2045 at around uh, 1.4 billion pounds uh, uh, CO2. And we also uh, estimate several mitigation scenarios that for this, uh, for uh, uh, mitigation scenario, we assume that 10%, uh, uh, 20%, 30%, and 40% reduction of the accumulated carbon emission during 2010 to 2050 compared to the reference scenarios. And you can see that a lot of change on the energy supply side. For example, for the M4 scenarios, the, for the power generation, you can see more than 80%, uh, 85 cents uh, electricity will have to supply provided by the uh, non fossil energies. And also in the primary energy consumption, you can see almost 65 cents of the primary energy consumption, uh, consumption by 2050 will be applied by non fossil energies. And also the carbon mitigation scenarios uh, lead a lot of change, not only on the supply side, but also on the demand side. Uh, for the demand side, for example, you can see for the for, for several uh, NU sectors, they acquire, the, the scenario required about uh, as high as 35 cents reduction of the energy service demand. So energy service demands reduction uh, can contribute to about 20 cents of the CO2 emission, uh, CO2 mitigation by the end of 2050. And also, we estimate uh, the co benefit from local air pollutant reductions from the least uh, carbon application scenarios. You can see the SO2 can reduce about uh, from 10% to 60% in the different mitigation scenarios, and, uh, and the SO2 reduction is mainly come from the power generation sector and also industry sector, while lobster reduction is mainly come from the transportation sector and power sector. And combined with the, this uh, scenarios uh, uh, research and also the Chinese government's uh, announcement last year that China would uh, pick the carbon emission around 2030, so we direct uh, 
the low carbon emission pathway to see how China would uh, pick the, uh, the carbon emission around 2030. You can look, you can see that uh, picking China's carbon emission around 2030 will require the industry sector to pick before or around 2020 to 2025 at around 4 billion tons carbon emission, uh, CO2 emission. And for power sector, uh, we expect to pick around uh, 2025 to 2030 at around also 4 billion tons CO2, and then decrease very fastly to about 2 billion tons CO2 by the end of 2050. For building sector, actually, uh, it will expect to uh, pick around 2040 and around uh, 1 billion tons of CO2, and transportation sector is back to pick around 2050 at around 2 billion tons of CO2. So how to achieve this uh, carbon development uh, pathways? You can see this is the, uh, the, 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 uh, the energy supply. You can see the coal consumption is, will be had to pick around 2025 or 2020 at around 2.8 uh, million tons coal equivalent, and then we will decrease faster to about 2 million tons coal equivalent by the end of 2050. And also, 20% of this coal consumption will have to consist of CTS. And natural gas, you can see the natural gas actually will increase from the currently about in the, uh, 2010, it's about 100 billion uh, cubic meters of uh, uh, natural gas used in China, and it will decrease, increase fastly to about 600. Uh, uh, billion cubic meter by the end of 2030 and 750 billion cubic meters by the end of 2050. And for the supply of this natural gas, uh, the, the domestic uh, conventional natural, uh, natural gas may uh, supply about uh, 250 uh, billion cubic meter of natural gas, and also a non conventional natural gas uh, supply mainly from the shale gas and coal machine will supply about uh, 200 billion cubic meters. And from the uh, pipeline, uh, pipeline import, natural gas import across the LNG would uh, provide uh, about 300 uh, billion uh, kilometers uh, natural gas. And from the uh, non crucial energies, uh, including hydro, wind, solar, biomass, <coughs> nuclear, you can see the share will uh, go up to about 40% by the end of 2050 in the primary energy consumption. And look at the electric sprite, uh, you can see the, the, the nuclear is back to uh, expand from the current today 11 gigawatt to uh, 300 to 400 gigawatt by the end of 2050. And wind is then to increase from 40 gigawatt uh, uh, currently to about uh, 800 gigawatt by the end of 2050. And solar is from uh, currently is about 10 gigawatt and also is back to very fast growth to, and to increase to about 800 gigawatt by the end of 2050. And uh, hydro is back to exploit about 500 gigawatt by the end of 2050. So together, all these uh, uh, non fossil energies will apply to about 65 cents of the total electricity output. And also based on the modeling results, we can develop the uh, uh, carbon development roadmap for technologies in both, in both uh, supply side and demand side. And here just go uh, to uh, uh, figures for the steel sector and ammonia sector. And based on the this uh, deployment rate from the model result, we can also debate whether the, uh, the, the, the cost curve for these uh, technologies to show the mitigation potential and also the mitigation cost for different technologies. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Oh, oh sorry, I, I still had the uh, 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 slide. Sorry. And, and this is so the key indicator for the low uh, development, uh, uh, low carbon development in China. Uh, for the first uh, figure, you can see uh, the, the, the GDP uh, is back uh, to about eight times to by the end of 2050 compared to the 2010. So uh, uh, from the uh, you can see from the energy intensity per GDP actually expect to decrease about 50% uh, by 2030 and also by 70% uh, uh, by the end of 2050. And for the carbon intensity per GDP, per GDP actually expect to decrease about 60% by 2030 and 80% uh, by the end of 2050. And also uh, you can look at the, 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 the Power sector, you can see the per kilowatt carbon emissions is back to reduce, for example, by 2030, uh, to reduce about 35% compared to the Naomi 
2010, and also by the end of 2050, it's back to a degree, of, a degree to 35 cents of the 2010 level. Uh, to, uh, actually, a, a 35 cents reduction compared to the 2010 level. And also, the industry sector carbon emission per various editor also need a lot of reduction. You can see about it. 60% reduction and 80% reduction for the year 2030 and uh, 2050. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, as a welcome as a speaker. Prosperity in Norway. 
It was actually renewable energy. It was the beginning of the prosperity of Norway. We were among the absolute poorest countries in Europe. And the, that first development into becoming a middle income country was not from oil and gas, as many people think. It was actually from using our renewable energy sources that were readily available in Norway. However, in the beginning, the focus was, let's say, very one dimensional. It was about bringing on, bringing into the country, developing energy for industry, and then also for infrastructure and for public consumption. But it was a very clear idea we need to develop the country economically. So there was a lack of understanding at that point also of the social and the environmental impacts that these hydropower dams and facilities had. I also think it's fair to add that there was a lack of understanding of basic health and safety. And I'm adding that because when we discuss uh, fancy concepts like externalities and like a calculus, and we sometimes forget the people themselves working to develop all these energy sources. Um, we've had some examples recently in Turkey showing that there can be a high price to pay for those working within the energy sector. Anyway, so today uh, our approach is much more like this. It's much more about having to earn the license to operate. On the one hand, having a clear sense of purpose. We need to deploy and develop more renewable energy globally. On the other hand, saying that we shouldn't replace one problem with another. Uh, I, I feel that humans, we have a, a special talent for that, <laughs> uh, replacing one problem with another problem. And this could definitely be an issue in terms of renewable energy, but because it's renewable, it's good if you look at it from an emissions point of view, but then it might re be replaced with other, more local problems, social problems and environmental problems. So that's why we put up this one. It has to be something we do to earn the right to develop uh, in relation to our stakeholders. I won't go through too many details about us, but just to say something, yes, we are the largest renewable generator in Europe, largely because of our capacity coming from Norway. It constitutes roughly one-fourth of the total reservoir capacity in Europe. So that's where we come from. But now, based on that competence, uh, we are developing into a global company. Now we're present in 23 companies worldwide. We are developing hydropower. This uh, image here is actually from a plant here in Turkey. It's called the Kadri plant, 102 megawatt uh, around the river plant. And it was actually uh, entered into commercial operations last week. So it's a very new plant, and I'm actually going up there tonight because we are celebrating with the team tomorrow. Um, we are also developing uh, hydro, uh, wind power onshore. This, is, this image is from uh, Sweden, and Stockholm is now the leading player in the Nordics on the onshore wind deployment. But also, we are part of consortiums developing huge projects now in the UK, outside the UK. I, I, there was a reference made also to the United Kingdom being less ambitious in terms of wind power. I think that uh, point is probably not taking into account the massive development of offshore wind outside of the UK. This particular one we part of in Dogenberg is, has a total of 10,000 megawatts and it lies on the sandbank just between Norway and the UK. So definitely a lot of things happening also on the wind side in, in, in the UK. Um, and just adding to these slides, I'd also like to mention we are uh, among the largest and maybe most sophisticated trading houses in Europe in terms of trading power across, across the continent. And we're using that competence a lot to develop new business models also both there in Turkey and other places trying to see how the future of energy markets will develop. So we think in terms of innovation, it's not only technological innovation, but it's also innovation in the business model. Because we think the whole industry is about to change. We're in the power industry. Right, that was about our company. I'd like to take a, a little bit of a view on some of the impacts and the challenges that we're facing in the field, on the ground, when developing um, renewable energy projects. And some of, most of the examples are from hydro trying to address maybe part of the reason why hydro is not in the mix sometimes when it is mentioned. Um, coming from Norway, we've had a history of a long debate in the environmental impacts, and I will come back to that. But we sometimes tend to forget that there are human beings involved also, and they are largely affected. We are developing hydropower projects in places such as Laos, some of the images are from, from Laos. We are developing in the northern part of Sweden. We have the Sami example over here. And I think we consistently see that developing energy Whatever it is, whatever source it is, is a trade-off between the, uh, the benefits of this and especially the local impacts. And the stuff that we have really been working very hard to find ways to be able to develop even the large-scale projects in such a way that it does become a win-win situation. 
If you want to summarize all the international standards that are linked to big infrastructure development, they always end up with saying that you should make sure that people are at least as well or preferably better off after you develop the project and before. And we take that very seriously. And we see that there are ways of doing that. So for our projects, for instance, in, in Laos, we have to move people. It's a big reservoir. It's one of those projects that will typically be criticized. But it's also become one of the best practice projects in the world, showing that it can be done. We are monitoring uh, a lot of socioeconomic indicators to see how people are after we've done this and the way that we've done it. And we are showing that it is possible to develop also large scale in a responsible way. The, um, this is a typical example of how you can see a big project and how it would be presented. This is from one of our largest ones here in Turkey, uh, it's called the Chetik Project. And this is a typical engineer's or economist's way of presenting it. You show all the data, all the, all the megawatts, that is what you present. If you want to take a social attitude to building a big hydro power plant, you should maybe start more with this perspective. This is the same project, but it's showing all the villages. It's the seven villages, 11,000 people, and so on. In this project, no one will have to move. But as we've learned in Stuttgart, it's not really about people's homes and if they have to move their homes. It's about livelihoods, it's about communication. And that's a big, big issue when it comes to hydro power. So we have spent a lot of time analyzing and understanding all of these villages, not just analyzing them, but also spending time with them, talking to them. You can imagine what these discussions are about. Some in homes, some in schools. These young men are hoping for employment. We will be employing 1,500 people to develop this project. It's a huge boost for the local uh, economy. But this type of interaction, the willingness to go there, to talk to people, and to work with the aim of finding a win-win situation is critical. In Norway, if you if you are born into a municipality where there's hydropower, you're born into you're you're the luckiest person in Norway because they have the best schools, the best hospitals, the best roads, everything. Because it's a local benefit to any big uh, investment. In many countries, that's not really the case. And Turkey also has a challenge on this. So this is where we, as a company, have to find ways to develop it so that there is a local content, makes it just a local stake in this, and that people can see that this is good for their local communities. <coughs> Also, it's about being here in the present and responding. Our project right now is on the border of Syria. We have lots of Syrian refugees. It's not just about analyzing and planning and compensating and working and that side. It's also responding to very urgent needs. And here in Turkey, this is a very, very critical situation. As you know, we have more than 2 million refugees from Syria. As a company, we need to respond somehow. And this is it. The energy part of the future has to be integrated with what's happening in, in society as such. It so should not be isolated. The environmental part is much more familiar to you, but I think we've, we've spent a lot of time analyzing and understanding how can we develop waterways with hydropower and still have healthy uh, biodiversity in that river. Norway has become one of the leaders in doing so, developing technology and methods that allows fish to thrive even though there are, this is a regulated waterway. Now the next frontier is really much about bird life and trying to understand the same dynamic for wind power. It's an issue. Uh, I don't know how, how uh, well versed you are within the life of birds. But uh, it appears that birds tend to prefer the same areas where it's really good to set up the wind farms. It has to do with where they can be carried up to the higher uh, levels of, of, uh, uh, of the sky. So it's, uh, it's uh, really important to analyze not just wind in terms of how good it could be for wind power production, but also to understand what will the birds be doing. And it's especially important, like with this big one offshore, to understand the migration paths for for birds. So this is the next frontier for us. We're really, we're investing a lot in understanding our method. <clears throat> this is just an example of what you can do as a company. We were looking at the project in the Balkans. This was the original plan that came out from the government side. This is what they had done, but the engineers have seen how can we just get as much out of this as possible. So a 900 gigawatt hour type of project, and it was a very huge reservoir where they were expecting 11,000 people would have to move. So we put our uh, uh, designers and engineers on it to have a look and see, could we optimize this so that this was more manageable and more sustainable from a social and uh, environmental point of view? And we ended up with this one.